Hello, I'm Patrick Wong. I'm a consultant anaesthetist at Singapore General Hospital. My lecture today is airway management in COVID-19 patients. Okay, the lecture is about COVID-19, healthcare worker transmission, aerosol generating procedures, principles of airway management, and I'll be discussing the difficult airway society guidelines and comparing them with the recent COVID-19 guidelines and how we should be updating our practice. And finally, something about extubation. Here it is, the SARS coronavirus 2. It is highly contagious, has a reproduction number of two to three. The COVID-19 pandemic was declared early March, 2020. In one hospital in China, hospital transmission rates was as high as 41% and it has a case fatality rate of 3.4%. Okay, hot off the press, on May the 4th, Star Wars Day, there are 187 countries and regions affected, three and a half million confirmed cases, and almost 250,000 confirmed deaths. Healthcare worker transmission. In China, early this year, 4% of all cases were healthcare workers, went up as high as 63% in Wuhan, the epicenter. In Italy, 11% of cases were healthcare workers, and the WHO, WHO reported 22,000 healthcare workers being infected in 52 countries. So there are the numbers, and the Guardian put some faces to some of these numbers. This is a report and it showed 100 NHS workers who died from COVID-19 and they were doctors, nurses, porters and volunteers. Healthcare workers are affected because we're involved in uh, procedures that are risk factors for virus transmission. So tracheal intubation, tracheostomy, non-invasive ventilation, and face mask ventilation. In a recent study uh, from Wuhan, over 200 emergency intubation, there were no cases of transmission and the estimated transmission rate was unlikely to be more than 1.5%. Aerosol generating procedures. There is a whole list of these procedures and as an anesthetist, we, we do this almost on a daily basis, intubation, extubation and face mask ventilation. Other procedures include open suctioning, tracheostomy, bronchoscopy, endoscopy, surgery that involves high-speed drilling, dental procedures, and various forms of ventilation. There are yet more procedures that are AGPs, including chest compression during CPR. AGPs are procedures that mechanically create and disperse aerosols, and procedures that induce the patient to produce aerosols. We induce by intubation and bronchoscopy, and we mechanically create by ventilation and suction. We now have something called social distancing. We are asked to keep one meter apart. And where is the evidence for this? There are mathematical, experimental, and human studies. And almost 80 years ago, Jenison, Jenison showed that aerosols travel by one meter. More recent studies the past 15 years show that aerosols can travel two to four meters. And one study showed it can travel as far as eight meters. So it's probably a compromise between science and what society thinks is necessary. Principles of airway management. This is about delivering a safe, accurate, and swift performance. So preparation of personnel, drugs, equipment, intubation kit. Have a strategy, an airway plan, A, B, C, D. Wear appropriate and checked personal protective equipment. Minimize AGPs. And your airway manager, someone who manages the airway, who could be an anesthetist, intensivist, ED physician, or other clinician, should be the most appropriate. Safely keep staff numbers to the smallest number possible. 
techniques should be familiar and reliable. Checklist and cognitive aids may help and ensure good communication and teamwork. Past two months, there have been many, many anesthetic COVID-19 guidelines. Some of these are airway focused and they are highlighted in gray in this table. I will be giving you the references for all these guidelines at the end of this lecture. Just, I will now discuss about the Difficult Airway Society algorithm for the unanticipated difficult airway. This algorithm is only five years old. Plan A is face mask ventilation and laryngoscopy. If that fails, plan B is supraglottic airway insertion and ventilation. If that fails, final attempt at face mask ventilation. If that fails, then you have a cannot intubate, cannot oxygenate scenario, and you should go on to plan D, front of neck access. Let's compare the difficult airway society guidelines with the COVID-19 guidelines. Preoperatively, we don personal protective equipment and we position and pre-oxygenate our patients. The DAS guidelines were published before the pandemic and there is no statement at all on personal protective equipment. The COVID-19 guidelines say we should don full PPE and have a buddy system that ensures safe and correct donning and doffing procedures. What is personal protective equipment? In the UK, this is gloves, apron, gown, N95 mask or equivalent, and eye face protection, either goggles or visor. There is no mention of PAPR. American guidelines say N95 or PAPR, powered air purifying respirator, face shield or goggles, gown and gloves. Other guidelines are much more strict. They recommend PAPR for intubation and extubation, double, even triple gloves, overshoes, and complete coverage of the head and facial skin. In hospitals in China, they said it was mandatory to report any inadvertent contamination of skin or mucosa and to assess the need for quarantine. Afterwards, you should shower and use oral, nasal, and external auditory canal disinfectants. The PAPR offers 2.5 to 100 times greater protection than the N95. However, not all guidelines uh, are strict about PAPR, as they, there is no reliable way to decontaminate external parts. Not all N95s are the same. Here we show the cup, fold, valve type respirators. In one study, they showed um, they all performed differently. You can measure their performance by the fit factor. This is a number between zero and 200. Adequate protection is if your fit factor is 100 or more. In this study, the fold type N95 performed the best. The cup and the valve performed less well during baseline measurements performed very much worse during chest compression. But stop before you run out and change your N95. Your face is different from everyone else's and the best way to, to choose which N95 is the best for you is to have a formal test that's using the bitter spray. Problems with uh, PPE can cause uh, peripheral vision problems, fogging, difficulty in auscultation and therefore making use of stethoscope difficult, communication is challenging, and it can cause headaches. One big take home message from this lecture is even in an emergency and including cardiac arrest, PPE should be worn and checked before all airway management, and staff should not expose themselves to risk or any circumstance. This is not just the uh, opinion of one person, Professor Tim Cook, this is the UK consensus statement made up of all the major airway, anesthetic, and intensive care societies. On to positioning. Both guidelines say head up and ramped in obese. However, the rationale is slightly different between the two. For DAS, it increases safe apnea time, increases direct laryngoscopic view, 
decreased airway patency and therefore improves apneic oxygenation. For COVID-19, it decreases your airway pressure should you need to perform face mask ventilation. DAS guidelines say you should pre oxygenate all patients. Endpoint is end tidal oxygen level of 0.9 or 90%. It does not state a time frame for this. And you can do this by giving nasal oxygen at 15 liters per minute or warm, humidified, high flow nasal oxygen at 70 liters per minute. However, these are AGPs. The COVID 19 guidelines say yes, pre oxygenate, but use 100% oxygen by a tight fitting mask for five minutes and avoid high flow nasal oxygen and non-invasive ventilation. Should you need to use these two uh, techniques, then apply a wet gauze over the face, over the nose and mouth of your patient. Be wary that using high flow nasal oxygen during a pandemic may deplete your hospital oxygen supply. A plan A laryngoscopy. This is made up of face mask ventilation, intubation, and number of attempts. DAS guidelines say face mask ventilation should be done as soon as possible after induction. However, it is an AGP. COVID-19 guideline, guidelines say you should avoid face mask ventilation and bypasses by intubating as rapidly as possible. Use rapid sequence induction. DAS say rapid sequence is for patients at high risk of aspiration, not for all patients. And you can intubate using either direct or video laryngoscopy. COVID-19 say that rapid sequence induction and intubation should be used for airway management. And this is from all guidelines. Rapid sequence means rapidly sealing the airway, minimizing aerosol contamination, bypasses the need for face mask ventilation, if your patient is paralyzed, they cannot cough, and you should use video laryngoscopy as first line technique. Rapid sequence induction and intubation can be modified by using small tidal, vo tidal volume ventilation if your patient becomes hypoxic. Ketamine if your patient is uh, cardiovascular unstable. Cricoid pressure is controversial, and I would probably consider it in patients with high risk of aspiration. There is a debate between using succinylcholine and rocuronium. If your patient is very sick, then consider intubating early to decrease the incidence of cardiovascular instability and pneumothorax on induction and intubation. Debate of, uh, between succinylcholine and rocuronium. Both rapid onset. Both give you excellent and good intubating conditions. Let's look at offset, how soon the patient starts breathing after you give them muscle relaxant. So sinarcholine, that's seven minutes. Rocuronium, just under four minutes. And that's giving sugamidex after intubation. So that's a potential bonus. But after failed intubation, do I personally want my patient to start breathing? No. So the benefit of having a fast offset, so what? Most of my patients, I will not want to wake up. I will go on to plan B, C, and D. And waking the patient up is not necessary, not feasible, and not safe. Safe apnea time. You could think of it either as how long your patient remains well oxygenated, or how quickly they desaturate after muscle relaxants given. For succinylcholine, it's four minutes. For rocuronium, it's six minutes. The reason why succinylcholine has a shorter state ap apnea time may be due to the muscle fasciculation, increased oxygen consumption. And for some reason, this decrease in state apnea time is obliterated if you give the patient lignocaine and fentanyl before succinylcholine. So the increased apnea time is a potential benefit of rocuronium. The other thing to look at is that even though this is from two different studies, Safe apnea time after signal coding may be shorter than the offset time. Both drugs also have complications, albeit quite rare. So before I finish about uh, intubation, uh, my colleagues at Singapore General Hospital have been innovating. So this is 
Claudia Tien's uh, team, the parachute and bread box. These are devices that uh, min uh, minimizes aerosol contamination and protects healthcare workers. As with all innovations, these needs evaluation. Are they too heavy, rigid, and bulky? Do they prevent caudal aerosol contamination? And what are the ergonomics for obese patients, ramp position patients? Do they hinder airway rescue? Do they cause injuries? And do they decrease contamination or add to the contamination? I certainly look forward to, how to see how these innovations develop later on. On to the number of attempts. So DAS guidelines say three plus one attempts. That plus one is the fourth by an experienced personnel. With COVID-19, the first attempt should be made by the most experienced and skilled airway manager. Attempts should ideally be three or less. My motto is the first attempt should be the best attempt. Is this not only to intubate and minimize aerosol contamination, but also to protect your fellow co-workers who are there at intubation. So plan B, using a superglottic airway as a rescue technique after failed intubation. One question is, is it an AGP? Short answer, it is logical that placement of an SGA superglottic airway is aerosol generating. So why do we use it? Well, compared with face mask ventilation, a superglottic airway forms a better seal, patients remain well oxygenated, and is hand-free. Compared with trachea intubation, it's faster insertion, you don't need to paralyze, and there's less coughing, and patients are more well oxygenated on immersion. Also, when you insert a superglottic airway, you can be standing further away from the mouth compared with direct laryngoscopy. However, there are disadvantages. There can be leaks at low, air, low airway pressures, and this could be caused by mouth positioning, which occurs in 50 to 80% of cases, and wrong size supraglottic airway. Leaks can occur at high pressure when you ventilate patients at pressures greater than the oropharyngeal leak pressure of your supraglottic airway device. This can occur due to mouth positioning again, incorrect ventilator settings, and patients having laryngospasm or bronchospasm. So leaks are causes of AGPs, and you may need to rem remedy these with rescue techniques. This includes supraglottic airway removal and reinsertion, face mask ventilation, and intubation. And these, in turn, are also AGPs. So the rationale for using a supraglottic airway as a rescue that is successful in 64, 65 to 94% of cases. Also allows you to stop and think. There are four options once you insert a supraglottic airway and it is successful at ventilation. You can continue with just a supraglottic airway alone, but this is risky because you can still risk losing your airway and there is also the risk of aerosol contamination in a COVID-19 patient. Option two, you can intubate via the supraglottic airway using a flexible bronchoscope, bronchoscope. And the good thing is that it seals the airway. Option three, waking up the patient. And option four, front of the neck access is rarely indicated or needed. In COVID-19, as well as rescuing the airway, it forms a better seal than face mask ventilation. And as mentioned before, it allows intubation, which is successful in 80 to 100% of failed intubations. It is best to use a second generation supraglottic airway device, one that allows intubation. So in COVID-19 patients, you can use a supraglottic airway for ventilation instead of face mask ventilation before or in between attempts at laryngoscopy. Although spontaneous ventilation is better via supraglottic airway for COVID-19 patients, we are most likely to be dealing with positive pressure ventilation. In these cases, you should be paralyzing and keeping your airway pressures low. Now we talked about supraglottic airway device as a plan B. Some people ask, should, should we or can we use supraglottic airway as a plan A? For example, you have a COVID-19 patient who comes in for uh, debridement of a wound to theaters and they want to insert a supraglottic airway instead of intubating. There are medical legal implications because remember, 
all 13 international COVID-19 guidelines say you should manage the airway using rapid sequence induction. So if you, uh, if you bypass these guidelines and use a supraglottic airway as a plan A, there are medical legal implications. Remember, when you intubate, you ask other staff to leave OT. And yet, placing a supraglottic airway is an AGP, and there are potential for leaks at any and many times during its use. During a pandemic, we are treating suspected and known cases of COVID-19. There will be times when we have patients who are asymptomatic but infected, and our staff members, healthcare workers, may not be wearing full PPE and therefore at increased risk of infection. So there is a medical legal argument that during a pandemic, should all OT staff wear full PPE during supraglottic airway use? Food for thought. But plan C, your supraglottic airway ventilation failed, so a final attempt at face mask ventilation. We use it to optimize oxygenation, but because it's an AGP, we need to minimize leak and minimize airway pressure. You minimize leak by using a two-hand VE technique. So VE is using two hands, using a thumb and eminence of hands to hold the mask, as opposed to the CE, which is just one hand using a thumb and index finger. Use a filter. In edentulous patients, put gauze in their mouth to fill up the mouth. And in patients with beard, consider shaving, them, shaving the beard off preoperatively. Minimize airway pressure by placing the patient head up, inserting oral airway, ensuring full paralysis, and have low flows, small tidal volumes, and pressure controlled uh, ventilation. Entitled in, oxygen monitoring can help. It tells you when you reach optimal oxygenation, and therefore you can stop face mask ventilation. Be careful about using some self-inflating um, bags. They have only a expiration diverter. They do not have a filter. So if you use these for face mask ventilation, you will get aerosol contamination during face mask ventilation. If you put a filter between the face mask and the self-inflating bag, that will minimize or eliminate aerosol contamination. So on to plan D, everything's failed, you have a cannot intubate cannot alternate, you have to perform a front neck access. Before the pandemic, there's always been an argument between should we perform needle or large bore cannula cricothyroidotomy or surgical cricothyroidotomy, a scalpel bougie tube technique. The, these uses two, four, and six millimeter internal diameter devices, respectively. The DAS guidelines say, use the surgical cricothyroidotomy. COVID-19 guidelines tend to go towards surgical cricothyroidotomy. The reason is that the needle cricothyroidotomy is that it needs high flow oxygen insufflation or high pressure oxygen uh, jet ventilation. DAS guidelines say you should uh, paralyze your patients and also apply 100% oxygen throughout using a supraglottic airway, a tight fitting mask or nasal insufflation. However, these are potentially AGP. So the COVID-19 guidelines say, yes, full muscle paralysis, but avoid positive pressure ventilation from above, nasal insufflation, diathermy, and open suction. For tracheostomy, stop the gas flow before opening the trachea. Now, some patients will already be intubated and you need to perform a tracheostomy Conventional treat, uh, teaching is that we deflate the cuff and pull the tracheal tube proximally, and then the trachea is open. It is at that point that aerosol contamination can occur, and it can occur even more if there are difficulties or delays. The surgeon may need to make a bigger incision, optimize hemostasis, and then perform a stay or rescue stitch to hold the trachea. So an alternative is, instead of pulling your tube, is to push your tube distally and hyperinflate the cuff. Maintain a closed circuit whilst the trachea is open. The surgeon can take as long as they want 
And then just before everything's all finished, at the very last moment, pull your tracheal tube and the surgeon inserts the tracheostomy tube. Also use a non-fenestrated tracheostomy tube with a filter already attached. Minimize suction or use a closed system. Beware percutaneous tracheostomy because that involves increased airway manipulation, serial, bronchial, uh, bronchial, uh, serial dilatation and use of bronchoscopy to confirm correct placement. Awake intubation. This is an AGP. So you should avoid unless indicated. It can cause coughing. Beware about sedation. If you under sedate, this can lead to an agitated patient may take off their surgical mask, which was acting as a PPE. Over sedation can cause complications requiring you to do things like face mask ventilation, which is an AGP. Uh, be careful about topicalizing, avoid nebulizers. Some guidelines say also avoid atomizers and trans kill local anesthetic. If needed, awake trachea intubation should be performed by the most skilled and experienced airway manager. Minimize local anesthetic aerosolization. Consider awake video laryngoscopy because it's faster than awake flexible bronchoscopic intubation. Where possible, use disposable scopes and disposable video laryngoscope blades. Extubation. Extubation is a high risk phase of anesthesia. It is potentially aerosol generating due to coughing and bucking. If things go wrong during extubation, then you may need to implement a rescue face mask ventilation. Examples include hyperventilation, breath holding, lyric spasm, airway obstruction, and residual block during extubation. There are also human factors to consider during extubation. There is time pressure. The surgeon wants you to hurry up, and get on with the next case. And there's operator fatigue and staff want to leave at an at the end of a long day. The, mains of, the aims of extubation are to minimize coughing and to minimize contamination. So minimize coughing by giving drugs, opioids, lignocaine, and dexmedotomidine. The last was considered the most effective in a recent systematic review and meta-analysis by Tang. Deep extubation and exchange your tracheal tube for a supraglottic airway. Two techniques include the Bailey method. The patient is already intubated. You insert a supraglottic airway behind the tracheal tube and remove the tracheal tube, leaving your patient to wake up smoothly with just the supraglottic airway inside you. The airway exchange catheter technique is in an intubated patient, you insert the exchange catheter into the tracheal tube, remove the tracheal tube, leaving the exchange catheter in the trachea. And then use the exchange catheter inside your trachea as a bougie. And you railroad your supraglottic airway over the exchange catheter, remove the exchange catheter, and again, leave your patient waking up slowly with just your supraglottic airway inside you. Now, I would like to stress that both deep extubation and supraglottic airway exchange is not for difficult airways. In general, a difficult airway patient should be extubated in the awake state. And minimizing contamination. There are many methods that I've described recently in letters and correspondence to anesthetic journals. This is one. So panel A shows white particles contamination during a normal extubation. Panels B and C, there are clear plastic drapes underneath the head, over the torso, and between the head and the airway manager. And this decreases for contamination during extubation. Then to summarize, to protect yourself and staff, wear appropriate PPE even in emergencies, minimize aerosolization, airway managers should be the most experienced and skilled, airway management is rapid sequence induction, pre-oxygenation, avoid face mask ventilation, and use a supraglottic airway device as a rescue device, but carefully. Awake intubation only if needed. Extubation is a high risk phase of anesthesia, and you need to minimize coughing and contamination. My next two slides are the references for the COVID-19 guidelines from anesthetic journals. 
is the first slide. And this is the second slide. And I end this talk on uh, some words from the New Zealand Prime Minister. Stay safe, be kind. Thank you very much.